caught in the middle of a violent political confrontation back home, Bob Marley had nearly lost his life in December 1976. Tugs had shot him, his manager, and his wife Rita. Bob was lucky to suffer only minor wounds. But I have already told you that story. Today, we're talking about what came next when Marley decided to move out of Kingston and into London as a political refugee in early 1977. What happened when the King of Reggae landed in the British capital? Well, great music happened. Hello, Top Patters. This is Simon Mas, your friend with a master's degree in music who can't wait to take you to the promised land. Let's then talk about a key album in Marley's excellent discography, Exodus. But what's with this promised land? Is that a real place? A biblical allegory? A state of mind? A bit of all three, really. Bear with me for a micro lesson in Rastafari. Or is it Rastafarianism? Rastafari was a religious and political movement active in Jamaica from at least the 1930s. Bob Marley was a devout follower. Like other Rasta men, he was convinced 1977 was to be a turning point in world history, the start of a mass migration of black people from all around the world towards Ethiopia, Coptic Bible Ethiopia, meaning more or less all of sub-Saharan Africa. This exodus to their ancestral home after centuries of tribulation and slavery would start a new age, one of peace and brotherhood. Africa thus became a quasi-mythical land, part real place, part religious topos, part philosophical idea. Why is this relevant, you ask? As we'll see in the next section, Exodus the album places the listener in the middle of this prophecy, reflecting even the before and after divide. But if you want to fully grasp what's going on in the music, there's one more thing to cover. Let's have a quick chat about Marley and punk. Once in London, Bob Marley liked having other Jamaican expatriates around, common people with shared origins and a down-to-earth outlook on life. It was through these expats that Marley first encountered punk. He attended a concert by The Clash. Marley didn't particularly like the music, but he did like the punk's wild spirit of revolt against the British class system. Meeting Marley, punk fans saw the living proof that common people could change the world for the better. And meeting punks, Marley got something back, something popping here and there in Exodus. Shall we delve into it, then? The first thing that you need to know about Exodus is that it has two distinct halves, side A of the original LP, first five songs is militant material. The tracks are ripe with uncertainty, tales of unfairness and abuse, apocalyptic images and difficult battles to fight, but it's hardly all doom and gloom. Even at its bleakest, the album gives the listener a sense that change is at hand, however tortuous the path leading to it. One needs to stay true to themselves and focus, like so much things to say points out. I find the song irresistible. A mix of humorous critique of the status quo and poetical images. Images getting Marley's deep message across to everyone who cares to listen. Lines like, when the rain falls, you won't fall on one man's housetop, instantly give you a moral compass. Should I care if people are getting worse off because of recession, inflation, wars, and so on? When the rain falls, it won't fall on one man's housetop. Should we care about climate change, y'all? When the rain falls, it won't fall on one man's housetop. The whole first side of the record also displays what Marley got out of punk. The awareness that all Jamaican pop genres were alive and well in the wider world. Take the horn section you can hear throughout Side A. It was a first 
for Bob. Was this a wink at the two-ton ska revival happening in the UK punk scene at the time? Maybe. True. The tasteful arrangements are much poppier than the acidic blast of ska horn sections, both in the original 1950s authentic Jamaican flavor and in the 1970s British ska variant. Still, one wonders. But there's another unmissable and clear reference to older Jamaican pop on the album Dub. Another Jamaican import, punks, had popularized in the UK. Marley decided to use dub in the title track, again in a subtler way than its 1960s or current counterpart. Dubbing techniques like the use of echo drenched reverb give Exodus an extra dimension. It's the key element that makes the track denser as it goes along, more hypnotic, spacier. But that's not the only element of the song that strays from the root reggae Marley had come to offer. Take the bass line. Let's dig out a little demonstration from my notes. This is the bass line on Exodus. This is the same bass line with a more authentic reggae feel. I hope even my shabby playing showed you the difference. Exodus became the focal point of the album mixing past and present western pop and root folk music, a kind of melting pot of experiences from the Rastafari world through time and space, leading to side B, the heartwarming side of hope. Remember that new era of mankind I was telling you about? We get to hear what it will be like. It's jamming that opens the dances. All right, we're a glorious piece of music and a look into this future, into a society in which different individualities work together to create something new and better, something different from the polar opposites of lonely individualism and collective standardization that have ruled our political discourses for decades. In this new world, everyone will keep their individuality while still belonging. I can see the most cynical of you rolling your eyes and grunt. Promises, promises. But the following songs show that Bob Marley keeps this new world anchored to reality more than your average preacher does. There's still plenty of work to do. One has to learn to wait to actively search for unity and love. Perhaps this is why both waiting in vain and the frankly otherwise matches turn your lights down low leave us with this taste of melancholia. They catch the lover wanting, demanding and yet realizing that even in this new world things might not go as we wish. But it's true happiness that closes the album, starting with three little birds. A love song to Cindy Breakspear or another of the many lovers of Mr. Marley. A tribute to the I Trees, the group of whalers backup singers headed by his Mrs. Rita. A religious song in which Bob salutes the morning of a new era brought by the three birds of Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Perhaps a trip to the not so distant past when Marley woke up in Kingston's Sunny Hope Road and not in rainy London. Your guess is as good as mine. But it's clear that when the individual stops obsessing about his wants and focuses on spirituality, the one love closing exodus, that's when true happiness can be experienced. But there's more than that in one love. Let's get together and feel there's a secret reading that I will divulge only after you hit that like button and why not share this very video with your friends. I'm waiting. 
Okay, seriously. One love is a religious statement and an interpolation of people get ready. The Wailers took the impressions tune and harmony and wrote a new song around them. But the track is also a blast from Marley's past. From 1964, the earliest days of the Wailers. From the time when Bob Marley, Bunny Wailer and Peter Tosh Three friends, united by their deep love of music and spirituality, recorded a punchier and faster version of this song, one of their very first tracks. And so, closing Exodus with One Love is like Marley telling you, see, I've been spreading this Exodus message the whole time. But much more importantly, it's a love message to his two former brothers from a different mother. After all the differences, the creative issues and the ego battles that split them up in 1974 after being shot and being forced to flee from Jamaica to save his life after the mythical exodus starting the new era is about to happen. Can we forget all the aggro and just stay close like we used to? And if you ask me, there's no better way to close this album. This video though keeps on going for another bit, just enough to give you some further listening advice and to tell you to support this channel if you want to help me produce more and better videos. You know how. A donation, a subscription, a constructive comment and remember to look into my free telegram channel for a monthly recap of my activities and exclusive music related posts. Link in the description or in this QR code. Now, if you like Exodus, what else can you listen to? Less religious, just as militant and 100% infectious. Zombie by Fela Kuti. In fact, I've already covered it in an old video. Do you want it more religious and less visionary? Can't go wrong with some Nasra Fateh Ali Khan. I think at some point Real World re-released two shorter albums I own, merging them into love and devotion. Quality! Or check out George Harrison's All Things Must Pass, a different kind of spirituality and message but still great music. And if you want something completely different in terms of sound, Mozart's Requiem in D minor K626 is certainly spiritual, religious, and really touching. Perhaps I should cover it in a future video. The man, after all, is the only other person I consider a proper musical genius, along with good old Johnny S. back. Well, that's enough for now. Stay tuned for more music-related content from yours truly. Until then, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye! Simon Mas, music you love.